Okay, well, I think let's go ahead and get started. We are here for Roses 2021, Unit 5. This is going to be on mapping with Liam Tony. Liam is a PhD candidate in the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and he is also a intern at the um, United States Geologic Survey in the Geologic Hazard Science Center. Um, Liam is a repeat instructor. He taught us mapping last year in 2020, and he, Liam also has done a lot of work helping organize roses. So we are very grateful for his participation and we are excited to have him here today. As a reminder, we do have the Q&A, so feel free to type questions into the Q&A and I will verbalize them to Liam when appropriate through his lecture. He's going to give a lecture and then we will move into the lab session. Alrighty. Um, thank you everyone for showing up today and thanks to Francisca and the rest of the Roses team for organizing the second edition of Roses. Uh, my name is Liam Tony, and I would first off like to thank our uh, folks and organizations that have supported us this year. And that includes the, uh, the SSA, Seismological Society of America, AGU, Seismology Section, uh, IRIS, and the Alaska Satellite Facility. And this week, we're going to talk about mapping. And so, First off, just a brief overview of the structure. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes talking about uh, map making using a few Python tools. And then we'll transition into working through a Jupyter Notebook uh, sort of structured tutorial. Um, after that, we'll take a break. Uh, we'll leave Zoom and uh, I've provided a lab notebook that folks can work on and I'll be able to answer questions on Slack for that. So first off, I did post this uh, poll in Slack and these are the results as of uh, yesterday, for me yesterday evening. And I was asking about the usage of three mapping tools in particular, um, which I'll, all, all three of which I'll talk about today. And those are uh, GMT, the generic mapping tools, uh, PyGMT, which is the Python interface to GMT, and CartaPy, which is another uh, Python package for mapping. And uh, these are the results. And I, I always think it's interesting to see sort of the usage, um, a lot of folks using GMT and then pretty evenly split between uh, PyGMT and CartaPy. And then a few folks who haven't used uh, any of the above, which I think you folks are actually the most lucky today because you have the most uh, to learn. And so I think uh, hopefully all of us can learn uh, something today. And briefly just to motivate why it's important to think about mapping as, as seismologists. So and there's the phrase, a, a beautiful a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and I think that you know maps are, are similar in that uh, a good map can communicate a lot, just like a good figure can communicate a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why uh, you should be excited and, uh, and willing to, to produce beautiful maps. Um, for one, it can help you actually understand your research. And so uh, if you were to plot up your earthquake locations with, with no geographic context um, in a blank XY plot in a longitude latitude, uh, you might not gain as much insight as when you add in uh, bathymetric contours and a hillshade or uh, locations of, of cities, for example, uh, for, for context for these hazards. So you actually can gain some understanding by, by putting your research results into a, a nice context in the map. Um, a good map also uh, can communicate a lot in, and, and look really great in a publication or uh, in a conference setting. Um, and finally, uh, as part of, an, of outreach efforts, um, good maps that, that give folks and, and ordinary uh, non-science people uh, context 
for hazards are very important. Um, and so that's the motivation for um, us sort of collectively becoming more proficient in, in making maps and making maps programmatically, which is going to be the focus of, of my lecture today. So today we're going to be working with uh, two tools in particular, and they're both Python tools. And the first uh, I'm going to talk about is PyGMT. PyGMT is a Python mapping and plotting tool, and it is powered by the generic mapping tools, GMT. And GMT is a set of command line tools that have been around for quite a while. And so when you combine GMT with the uh, power of Python, you get PyGMT. The second tool I'll be uh, talking about and we'll be using today is called Cartapy. And now Cartapy is also a Python mapping and plotting tool. Um, but Cartapy is actually built upon matplotlib and extends the functionality of matplotlib um, to, for mapping and sort of geospatial applications. And I wanted to point out that matplotlib is a very mature Python package. So that's a big, a big advantage uh, um, for Cartapy to be building upon on the experience and, and the years of development of matplotlib. And so Cartapy is, is built on matplotlib. And so in order to understand PyGMT, the first of the two tools, a little bit more, I wanted to talk briefly about GMT and its origins and how uh, GMT constructs figures. So I just uh, took this directly from the GMT website uh, it's just saying that you know GMT is, is open source collection of command line tools for manipulating geographic and Cartesian data sets, and so it can handle maps, but also standard plotting um, and producing high quality illustrations. And so GMT was really designed for uh, producing plots that are going to be on the printed page. So going up in posters or uh, going into uh, publications. And it's very mature. It's been around since 1988. And because it's been around for so long, and also because it's quite popular in the seismology community, uh, you have probably seen quite a few GMT figures in the wild. Um, and so very often when you are looking or reading a seismology paper, there's a map with uh, focal mechanisms plotted um, or slices through a tomographic model. Um, more often than not, uh, it's a GMT that has been used to construct that figure. But you may not have actually made too many of these GMT figures. And if you have, that's great. Um, but it can be a little daunting uh, due to the pretty opaque syntax of GMT commands. And so I've included a few examples down here. So there's a lot of flags, and then you have to add a sometimes complex uh, array of characters and slashes and pluses uh, to construct uh, your figure. And when you do, it's beautiful, um, but it's a little bit difficult to read and to learn as, as a newbie. And so one of the goals of PyGMT, in fact, a, a principal goal, I would say, is to make GMT more accessible, make it more easy to read, and in general, make it more what we call Pythonic, which means verbose and, and, and clear and, and more similar to other very popular uh, Python packages. So again, in order to understand PyGMT, we need to understand a little bit about how GMT works. And so in order to show this, I'm going to use uh, an example figure here that I've I've created, and so as you can see, this is a a map of the state of Hawaii, and just I'll just explicitly point out the map elements that we have here that we can identify. We've got our uh, sort of base map, which is the map frame. You can see we've got uh, ticks here and annotations with the degrees of longitude and latitude. Uh, we've got this nice, beautiful shaded relief bathymetry 
and topography. And we've got black coastlines, a symbol for Kilauea volcano, and then a, a text label. So those are the components of this GMT figure. And here's the code used to create this figure. And this, uh, since GMT is a command line tool, we use shell scripts. Um, you can do sort of one line commands uh, to create maps using GMT, but it's very co the common sort of old school workflow with GMT is, uh, is to create a shell script. And so this is the example shell script. And you'll notice here that we have uh, at the top this variable PS which is assigned, we have uh, H, the string hi.ps assigned to it. And you'll see that in these five commands, we're actually directing output and appending text, appending text output to this uh, ps variable. And so basically how GMT works uh, in the background, when you call a GMT command, it's just spitting out a bunch of instructions for how to draw something. And this PostScript file format, uh, which actually used to be used with printers, um, is a human readable uh, document. So you can open it in terminal and actually like use cat and actually read its contents. And its contents are describing how to draw the elements of the map. And so every GMT command is simply outputting those instructions and you're directing that textual output into a file and appending content to that file. And so each of these five commands, which we can kind of look at and identify what they're doing with the map are appending the relevant instructions to this file. So we've got the PS base map command um, that's doing the map frame, grid image uh, at earth relief 15 seconds. You might be able to guess that is sort of doing our bathymetry and topography. Uh, the coast command is doing our coasts, and then the XY, PSXY, and PS text are handling uh, the labels and the symbol for Kilobaya Volcano. And, and so all of these together create our PostScript file, which is then converted into a PDF um, or into a PNG or whatever we need uh, for our application. And so, one really important aspect of this way of constructing a figure. Uh, is that order is really important. Um, because we're appending each line after the next, um, the draw order is from the top of the file to the bottom. And so commands that we issue lower down or after uh, previous ones are going to appear on top of those previous commands. And so the way I like to show this is actually using a feature of PowerPoint. Um, so I have our figure here in PowerPoint, and I have just each individual layer created by each individual command um, separated into its own layer here. And so we have starting off with our PS base map command that's creating the map frame with annotations. And then we have grid image. And you'll note that grid image is just creating the shaded relief with imagery topography, the relief image. Um, and then we have our, our PS coast command. Uh, PSXY and PS text. And so the reason why order matters is if you were to call the PS text command for some reason, just immediately after that, uh, <clears throat> that base map command, then you'll see that we actually are below the image, the opaque image layer. And so there's no such such concept as a Z order. If you're familiar with matplotlib, the Z order keyword, which allows you to move uh, stuff vertically uh, in your in your figure, that doesn't exist for GMT. And so it's very important to issue the commands such that things are drawn in the correct order. So that's something that you need to be aware of when you're constructing GMT figures. So now switching gears to talk a little bit about Cartopie. And again, I've, I've taken something from the website here. Um, Cartopie is, is also a Python package designed for geospatial data processing. 
in order to produce maps and other geospatial data analyses. So it's got a similar goal to uh, GMT and therefore to, to Pi GMT. Um, but the difference is, you know, CartaPi is making use of Proj4, NumPy, and Shapely libraries and a programmatic interface built on top of Matplotlib, the creation of publication quality maps. And so, again, as I mentioned previously, um, CartaPi is, is extending the capabilities from Matplotlib. And so if you are familiar with Matplotlib and use it regularly, and if you are a Python person, that is very likely to be the case, um, CartaPi will, will already seem uh, fairly familiar to you because the plotting commands are are basically identical and um, they also point out in this in this second paragraph um, Cartify is able to make use of these python packages that have also been established and around for a while like numpy and others um, i want to mention briefly here that there's another tool called base map um, which has been uh, deprecated in favor of Cartify. So basically, Cartapi development is um, the ongoing and, and will be the, the maintained product moving into the future. And so uh, all new maps should be created with Cartapi and not base map uh, moving forward. And so support for base map is going to end. Um, so base map is another similar uh, product that is based upon matplotlib. And so, just like I, I showed for uh, the GMT figure, I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a Cartapi figure. So uh, on the left here, now I'm showing uh, Python code. And it's pretty similar to the structure you'd have for a very simple uh, matplotlib sort of uh, scatter plot. And so we have this, this top import here. Uh, we're importing the uh, CRS submodule uh, from Cartapi, and that's the CRS stands for Coordinate Reference System. And so that's how Cartapi handles uh, geographic uh, projections and sort of uh, coordinate systems and, and those important uh, parts of map making. And then we import uh, matplotlib as usual. And you can see that the basic structure, we create some axes, and we're adding a scatter, scattered point to them. You get to choose the color and the size and all that. And then we show the figure. That's um, exactly like you'd see for a matplotlib uh, sort of figure. Um, the differences are a couple important ones here that I've, I'm highlighting here with the green underline. And these are these two keyword arguments that are appearing in the uh, initial creation of the axes. And then down when we actually plot some data onto those axes. And those are the projection and transform keyword arguments. And these are really, really important to understand um, when you're using Cartapi to make maps. And so uh, the projection argument is telling Cartapi and, and therefore matplotlib uh, what projection to use for your axis. And so this controls. Um, the actual appearance of your map. So you could choose, um, here I have a Robinson projection, which is a nice projection for sort of a world map, um, but you could have a uh, UTM projection for smaller areas with units and meters, um, as well as you know, stereographic projection for, um, for a polar plot, for example. Um, and so that is where you choose the shape of your map. Um, but then when you want to add data to your map, you want to tell Cartapi the coordinate reference system for the data. Um, and so this is, is fairly similar to if you've used like a GIS product before um, where you had your map projection and then you import some data. Um, and if you've ever uh, been in the position where you want to you know, plot the locations of some lakes in Florida, but they end up in the middle of the Indian Ocean and you have no idea why, um, it's likely you've encountered this issue of, of specifying the wrong coordinate reference system for the data you're, you're trying to import. And so Cartapi will always assume when you add data with plt.scatter or plt.plot or, or any of those matplotlib commands that the data have the same coordinate reference system as your projection. Um, however, uh, if say your projection is uh, UTM, where the units are going to be uh, meters east and meters north, 
And then you try to plot uh, a longitude and latitude point uh, as I'm doing here, um, those longs and lats are going to be interpreted as eastings and northings in meters. And so that's where this transform keyword argument comes in. Um, here we're explicitly saying, hey, we don't care what the projection of the map is. Uh, these are lats, lats and longs. So these are geodetic um, coordinate reference system on, you know, on there, they exist on a, on a sphere. And then Cartopi with that information will, will automatically project your data and put it in the right place. And this is important because it's different from how GMT works. GMT is always going to assume that your data are, are in the same, uh, or, or in longitude and latitude or in, or in UTM, depending on your projection you choose. And so you can see that we have this nice properly projected point here, which corresponds to the location of, of Delhi. All right. So now to compare these two tools, um, and the important thing to keep in mind is, is these are both really awesome tools. And I personally use both of them, uh, depending on the application. Um, but they are different and they have their strengths and, and weaknesses. And so this table, I'm trying to, to sort of summarize those. And this is by no means comprehensive. And of course, um, this is constantly changing uh, because both of these uh, packages are undergoing rapid development. And I'm actually highlighting that with this first row here where I'm describing the current release. And so you'll note that both of these packages are in the zero point something phase of, of versioning. And the way versioning works is uh, the first, the leading digit is corresponding to your major release. And then the second digit uh, is, is your minor release. And that's where uh, breaking changes can occur. And so you can see that both of these are in that um, just updating the minor release stage. Um, so they're both uh, very much in their infancy. And that is both a benefit and a drawback. It's a benefit because new features are getting added all the time. And actually, since I uh, developed these materials earlier in the summer, um, PyGMT has released another version with, with more features. Um, and Cartopi is similarly uh, growing very rapidly. Um, but it's also a drawback in the sense that um, you might design code to work around a certain syntax for either of these, um, and then that syntax actually gets changed or updated in a, in a later sort of release with, that's making breaking changes. Um, and so until we get to that, that first digit, that major release, um, the stability uh, can be variable. Another big, uh, that's, so that's a sort of a similarity between the two packages. Um, and then a big difference, which I've, I've already discussed um, in some detail, is the backend. So PyGMT is using GMT. Um, that means that if you're familiar with GMT, but you like to use Python, uh, you're totally in the right place. Um, and uh, then with Cartopy, the, the plotting backend is, is matplotlib, um, which is an advantage in the sense that if you're familiar with matplotlib, you can transfer a lot of those, uh, of that plotting intuition um, directly to using Cartopy. Um, one aspect that's you know becoming more relevant, especially with um, with more virtual and sort of digital based delivery of of scientific content and presentations, is the interactive um, factor. Now, PyGMT being based on GMT is designed to produce static maps, basically PDFs or, or PNGs. Um, to be inserted into publications and, and, and used in conference materials or maybe in, in um, as static images in uh, uh, conference talks. Um, Cartopi, on the other hand, because it's built on matplotlib, uh, has that same interactive functionality. And so you can produce um, interactive figures that you can pan and zoom and sort of query the location by hovering your, your cursor and all that sort of good stuff. Um, and so for exploratory data analysis, sort of geospatial data analysis, um, Cartopi might be a more useful tool. Um, the installation, uh, I just put in installation via Condi here because that's um, becoming more, more and more the, the standard in terms of dealing with dependencies and both of these packages are available on Conda. And, and uh, I might bite my words to say this, but um, 
seems like folks are able to install and, and utilize these for this course. It's a, it's it's a, been fairly well tested at this point. Um, so there shouldn't be any issues installing either of these. Um, mapping features. So this is an interesting one because uh, PyGMT being built on GMT has all of the functionality that GMT has. And that's because PyGMT in the background is just calling these GMT modules, is what GM GMT calls them, for producing these various map elements. Um, I'll put an asterisk there because uh, the PyGMT team actually needs to wrap or produce a nice uh, Python interface to these individual mod modules and add them to the uh, PyGMT API. And that takes some time. Um, however, you can always use PyGMT to access any GMT module, um, which is a really important uh, feature. And I'll show that how to do that in the lecture notebook a little bit later on here. Um, Cortipy uh, has to produce all of these mapping uh, features and new functions and everything um, from scratch because they're not, uh, they don't have the benefit of having this uh, pre-existing um, plotting library to just, to just wrap around. And so that means that there are fewer mapping features available to Cartopy. Um, however, um, the team is, is doing a great job of, of, of adding additional features and it's an awesome open source project. And so there's a lot of folks uh, producing, uh, producing uh, additional features and, and contributing additional features. So that's, that's increasing. Um, both of these tools support a wide array of projections, probably more than most people will ever need to use. Um, I know I personally have not nearly uh, used uh, e even half of the available projections for, for PyGMT. And so, and so that'll be probably enough to cover, to cover anyone's uses. And then finally, um, a, a note on grid operations. And by grid operations, I mean, um, for example, uh, reprojecting a, a digital elevation model um, from one coordinate system to another to plot, or producing a, a nice looking hill shade um, of a digital elevation model. Um, PyGMT is a little bit faster than Cartopy in this because since it's built upon GMT, and GMT is written in C. It's got some very, some very fast, uh, and it calls upon very fast libraries um, to do that sort of uh, reprojection and regridding. And um, Cartopy is is using Python um, Python tools, which can be a little bit slower. Um, however, that also might change in the future. And so, there's basically an, an overview, a comparison of these two tools. Um, I think it's important for people to know both because depending on the application, both can be useful. So uh, I found a slide here before we move uh, to the notebook, uh, interactive notebook tutorial. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, getting your data um, into Python and, and using, using data and plotting data with these tools. And so basically as a general, uh, rule of thumb with, with a couple exceptions that I'll mention, you just wanna read your data into Python um, and then you're set and use Python data objects. So NumPy arrays or um, uh, X-Array or Pandas, these are the tools that you wanna be housing your data in um, that make it most easy uh, to utilize these tools. So uh, Curtipy, um, we'll work with any sort of data data type that you use with matplotlib. And so usually that, you know, if you're plotting a, an image, that would be a numpy and the array. Um, or you can have um, tabular data. Um, and then with PyGMT, um, PyGMT uses, makes uh, a lot of use of X-Array. And X-Array, if you're not familiar, is a, um, n-dimensional arrays, kind of like uh, NumPy arrays, but they have labeled axes. And so you can actually have your um, digital elevation model um, with its coordinates attached with its longitude and latitude, for example, or UTM easting or northing actually attached and labeled. And so that entire object is, is self-describing and you can provide that object to PyGMT and PyGMT will know how to display it on a map. Um, 
The exception I'm talking about with reading data into Python is that PyGMT can also just directly plot um, data files. And so if you, if you use GMT before, you know that uh, it can handle NetCDF files and just directly plot those. Um, and uh, PyGMT can do the same. And then a final note um, for folks that work a lot in GIS um, systems or do work with Google Earth, um, it's important to understand that there are tools within the Python ecosystem that allow you to easily read those file types in to Python. And so if, for example, you are planning your nodal uh, array deployment on a volcano and you're mapping all of those locations out in Google Earth, um, you can then ex export a, a KML file or a KMZ file of those um, and read that into to Python and then plot those using either of these tools. Um, and so that, that's really important to understand. So now I'm going to turn to the tutorial notebook, the lecture notebook. And so I have, um, just as a reminder here, um, how to do that. And um, let's give a folks a few minutes to do that. And I'm going to take a short break here, but I'll, I'll be around to answer any questions. Um, so I've not been monitoring the chat, but let's take a couple of minutes to transition here. We don't have any questions yet, so we'll give folks a minute or two to get their labs up and running. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so I'm screen sharing here and I'm going to go to the lecture notebook. So the, the notebook that I'm going to be, that folks should be following along with me here on is the roses underscore mapping underscore lecture, the IPython notebook. And I'll give folks a few more seconds to get there. All right. And uh, definitely don't be afraid to, to ask questions about the, um, the usage of either of these tools or um, how they work together. Um, you can always ask these sort of questions after the fact in the Slack channel. So now that I've talked about PyGMT and Cartapy in some detail, uh, let's, let's get our hands dirty and, and jump into to using the code here. So I'm going to start off with a demonstration on, on PM, PyGMT and then we'll move to Cartapy. I am more familiar with PyGMT, so that will be the focus of, of the notebooks today. So like any Python package, we first want to import PyGMT. And the next, the first step when you create a PyGMT figure is really similar to when you're working with matplotlib, um, which is creating a figure instance. And I want to point out um, one of the really important tools for using PyGMT is the PyGMT website. And so um, the PyGMT website has this section called the API reference. And I'm gonna actually navigate to that here. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, so once you create a figure, these are all the plotting methods available to you. And generally speaking, each one of these uh, methods corresponds to a GMT module that has been wrapped. And so each of these is um, manipulating the plotted data or adding, uh, sorry, manipulating the, the figure um, attributes or uh, plotting additional map elements. 
And so that's the, a really important resource that I've linked here in the notebook. And so let's start off with a simple example. Oop. Let's go this way. Um, let's see if I can get this to uh, run here. That's odd. Um, let's see if I can. Run it this way. Okay, I think it looks like it's still trying to navigate me to that same link. Um, okay, that was a little odd. Um, so we'll run this command, which is figure.coast. And so you can probably guess what it what is it is actually plotting. Um, and you'll see that nothing actually happened after we executed this command. Um, and the reason why is that we always need to end our, our uh, figure with a call to show, and that will actually show our map. And so this is what the result of that single command um, actually does. And so you can see we have this nice world map, um, and we can go back and look at these various keyword arguments, um, and, and I can point out what each one does. And so we have our region, we're saying G for global. We choose a projection. We have shorelines, yes, we want them. We want to paint the water a certain color. We want to paint the land a certain color. Uh, and we want uh, there to be a frame around the map. Um, another option you can do um, is adding this additional optional keyword argument to the show call, uh, method equals external. And this will actually open the PDF in an external uh, viewer. And so when I do that, I'm on Mac, so it opens up this PDF in preview. Um, and uh, just note that if you're using the cloud option, since that is a uh, that is just a remote uh, machine, you will not be able to to utilize this option. So. Yeah, in our fig.coast call, we had a couple of arguments and I'm gonna talk about the important ones here. There's a lot of text here that I'm just going to skim over, but you can always return to this notebook to get a little more information. So in GMT and in PyGMT, um, you always must provide a region for your map. Um, and that's actually a requirement. And so there's not, uh, um, in most cases, you're not going to be able to uh, just plot your data without specifying the region of interest. And so that's used, um, specified with region here. Um, and that's usually provided as a list um, with X min, X max, Y min, and Y max. Um, so there's an example of a region. Um, but uh, you can also use um, something cool with um, ISO country code strings instead. And so, for example, if you just said region equals EG, that will give you the region of Egypt. Um, and then there's also region equals G, which will give you a global domain. I do see a question. Okay, does the external plot save the image locally? Um, no, it does not. Um, when you have that external uh, file, it's basically creating a, a temporary file on your machine and then opening up that file. Um, you can just directly save that file. Um, but you can also make a call to fig.savefig, which uh, will save the file. So you can do that programmatically as well. But yeah, it does not save the file. It's just a temporary file on your machine that does get destroyed. Um, so there's also the projection argument. That's the other really important uh, sort of mandatory uh, argument for PyGMT. And you can think of that sort of as, as equivalent to the projection keyword argument in Cartapy, where you're actually saying uh, you're, you're specifying how you want your map to look. Um, and PyGMT supports a really wide array of projections. Um, there's all sorts of, of more exotic uh, projections that you can use that look really cool. Um, and 
Projections are specified as strings with the first letter corresponding to the type of projection. And then you have some additional uh, numbers which will specify the uh, any additional information about the projection, such as like the central longitude or um, the central latitudes of that projection. Um, and then the final, uh, the final number in that string is going to be the width of your map. And so it's a bit strange carryover from GMT, uh, but you specify the, the width of the size of your figure actually when you specify that projection string. So the easiest way to demonstrate this is by just showing a few examples. And so um, let's plot here. This is a image of the coastline of um, Northwest Washington state and into uh, British Columbia, Canada. And we have the region argument here. And I'm going to go ahead and modify that. So let's extend it a little bit northward. Let's go up to maybe 60 degrees and expand it a little bit uh, westward as well. So let's go to maybe 140 and run it here. So you can see that now we have a, a larger area in our map. And um, now I'm going to try again with the Mercator projection. You can do um, us.hi. And so you can use ISO country codes uh, and then you can use, um, you can plot US states um, by, by using this sort of form of US dot and then state name. Um, so my example, here's the country code for Egypt. Uh, and you can see that it automatically is selecting the correct bounding box. So this is a nice shortcut um, for, for getting the regions corresponding to a sort of um, geographic entity or ge political entity. Um, now, returning to the same example above, uh, but this time using a different projection. Here I'm using a stereographic projection and uh, the stereographic projection requires a couple of additional parameters. And so those are the uh, central longitude and the uh, reference latitude for this projection. And then I have, of course, the mandatory width of the map. And uh, so just to show how it works when we adjust these parameters, um, I will try specifying the central uh, longitude to be 130. And let's see what happens here. You can see that the map actually looks the same, but now the um, minus 130 longitude is actually the one that's, uh, that's vertical here up and down. And so the map has effectively been rotated. And so um, in this case, I chose minus 125 because then the meridian uh, is, is up and down. So we'll change back to that. Um, and then I chose 90 here. Uh, this is as the latitude reference because basically that means that if we were to extend the meridians corresponding to the left-hand side and right-hand side of this map up, they would meet um, at the North, the North Pole. And so this is a useful projection to use for uh, for sort of polar regions. Um, hey, Lee, yeah. before, before we move on, you have a question. Um, so the question is that there isn't a figure size command. Is the aspect ratio always locked to the region and the projection specifications? Yeah, that, that's correct. And so that's a, that's a great question too, because um, that's another big difference from matplotlib where you can have your figure and then you can stretch it and whatnot and it's going to scale. Um, GMT and therefore PyGMT does not work that way. And that's because together the projection and the, uh, and the region specification entirely control that aspect ratio. Um, so once you've set those two things, you can't scale the map or you'd be distorting it. Um, and so 
that's basically, I think, why it operates that way. And so when you are changing that map width, that's scaling the entire map, maintaining that aspect ratio. And I can sort of demonstrate that if I choose um, a larger size for this figure. So if I choose a width of six inches instead, you can see that the aspect ratio has stayed the same, um, but you can imagine this figure being larger. In this case, um, the automatic inline display has just shrunk the text size effectively. Um, but if you were to save this as a, as a PDF, it would be in fact wider. And so if I went to two inches, um, the opposite will be true. We'll have this, that doesn't look very great, but um, really, really a large text size. But yeah, the aspect ratio is, is fixed. Um, another example with the projection. Uh, so here we have um, a map of Alaska, again, using a stereographic projection. And um, let's see what happens when I change this to Mercator instead. So let's make it a Mercator uh, projected map, eight inches. And uh, you can see this map, which makes me kind of sad because I live in Alaska and this is a, a poor representation. <laughs> of our state, we've actually distorted it quite a bit here. Um, this is what a Mercator uh, projection looks like. And since uh, Mercator maps don't work well with the poles, um, if I increase this region, this latitude to 80 degrees, um, you can see that we get a pretty strange looking, strange looking map. And so this is just a reminder to pick a projection that is suitable for the area which you are trying to map. So um, I can also demonstrate what, what it looks like when we get to 90 degrees here, um, just to reinforce this idea that when we have a stereographic projection um, with that reference latitude of 90 degrees, those two meridians are going to meet um, at 90 degrees. So now that we've covered the region and projection arguments, um, let's actually get into plotting. And so um, a key command you'll probably be using a lot is figure.plot, and this handles plotting scattered points as well as line data. So I'll go ahead and just show an example of this where I'm randomly selecting some longitudes and latitudes, and we're just gonna scatter plot them on the map. Um, color is controlling the fill of these points. Um, and then style is a keyword argument that controls both the uh, shape of the marker. So that'd be like marker equals in, uh, in matplotlib and then also the size. And you can specify the size in points or you can specify it in um, uh, sort of units such as like inches and, and centimeters. And that's covered in, in the text I've written above. Um, and Let's try updating some of this. And so instead of stars, if I wanted to plot um, some circles and I wanted the circles to be green, here are the green circles. Um, and this is all written up, um, documented in the GMT and, and PyGMT. Uh, documentation about what these um, single letters are corresponding to in terms of shape. Um, but let's have some smaller um, purple squares. Yeah, so that's basically how we, we can we can do scattered data. Fairly similar experience to plotting with, with matplotlib. Um, and sort of similar to matplotlib, if you want to add a simple legend to your plot, um, you can add the label keyword argument when you are making the plotting call. And then just um, GMT and PyGMT keeps track of that. And then when you call legend, um, you can uh, automatically create a legend from the plotted points. And you'll notice here that um, I was reusing this figure. And so uh, the figure actually was created up here, the pygmt.figure. And then every single call after that, I was reusing that figure instance, um, plotting additional points, showing it, 
adding a legend and then showing it again. Um, another really important command that you might find you're using often is grid image. And grid image is going to plot um, grids or raster data um, on your maps. And it's sort of similar to I am show. And you might find yourself using grid image a lot um, because PyGMT makes it really easy to add um, shaded relief to your map um, using the grid image command. And so GMT can read in and plot uh, geotiffs and netcdf files that you provide. Um, or you can actually use the special at file name syntax, um, which will download a grid from the GMT server and cache it locally on your machine and then display and display that grid. So that's a nice convenient way of uh, accessing some commonly used uh, digital elevation models and, and, and imagery and plotting them on a map. And so I'll go ahead and run this command. And uh, if you're using this on your machine, um, you'll likely uh, have to wait a little bit as it's downloading this earth relief data. Um, the GMT is actually making a call to the server and downloading that data and then caching it. And so you just have to note that if you're using GMT offline, um, you need to have already made that call to uh, cache that data locally. Um, so this is an example where uh, we have a grid specification. I'm using the at syntax. So this is going to download the earth relief at 10 minute resolution. Um, we have a global region here um, and then a, a suitable global projection, five inches wide, and then frame equals zero um, removes the ticks and annotations. And so in this case, I'm showing uh, two uh, versions of this figure. The first, um, just with the keyword arguments above, and the second one, I've added this additional flag, shading equals true. Um, and it might be a little bit hard to see here, uh, but on the left, we have no uh, shaded relief, and on the right, we do. Um, so it's very easy to construct a very nice looking shaded relief map um, using these, these files, uh, automatic files. And so I'll, I'll just briefly show here um, the various remote data sets that are available. I've linked this. This, this link is available in the, um, in the notebook. Um, but there are a number of resolutions of these grids available all the way down to one arc second um, uh, global relief from the, the shuttle radar topography mission. And so um, for these really high resolution data sets, um, GMT is not download the entire uh, globe, it'll download the relevant tile. Um, so these are, these are very useful for, for adding some geographic context to your maps quickly. And I do see a question here. Okay, I've got a number of questions, that's great. Um, could you explain where square and circles, lat and long pointed out in the script? All I saw is that you changed two things in the script. Right, um, up here, just for demonstration purposes, uh, I have randomly created some integers that are between uh, a, a minimum and maximum longitude and a minimum and a maximum latitude. Um, if you were using your own data, they'd consist of lists of longitude and latitude um, given to the X and Y. It's possible to link a PyGMT object and plot it on map.lib axes. Um, no. And so I'll talk about this when I, I talk about Cartopy. Um, but uh, the if you're trying to use both matplotlib and uh, well, basically you can't use both matplotlib, you know, subplot one and then a PyGMT subplot two. And the reason why you can't do that um, is because they're they're using totally different backends. Um, when you're using PyGMT, you're assembling a figure that's becoming a PDF output essentially versus in, in matplotlib, it's, it's interactive. And so because of that, you need to either go full uh, matplotlib or full pygmt, which sometimes might actually control which tool you use um, for a certain task. Um, question from Joey, um, why I'm using uh, keyword arguments. 
so this is just a shorthand. Um, I'm storing the keyword arguments as a dictionary and then I'm expanding that dictionary. Um, that would be equivalent to copying these four keyword arguments and pasting them into uh, here and also pasting them into here. Um, and another question is how does PyGMT deal with GMT defaults? Um, PyGMT actually provides a way to uh, modify GMT defaults. Um, and I can, I'll just point to that here. Oh, this is the GMT documentation. Let's go to PyGMT. Good test of how easy it is to find things on my website. Um, and we scroll down. Yeah, PyGMT.config. So there's a method called PyGMT.config that allows you um, to use uh, PyGMT to uh, modify a GMT default in your script. Um, and then you can also use a context manager um, to temporarily set that. So if you want to change the map frame type um, from fancy to plain for one particular figure in your script, you can do that with a context manager. Um, PyGMT does um, have, or GMT obviously does have that capability of plotting seismograms. And I'm not entirely sure if we've wrapped that yet. Um, the place to look would be the API reference, um, but I'll sh be showing later on in this tutorial how if it's not wrapped yet, you can still um, use uh, Python to call that module. Okay, so going back to the tutorial here. Um, so you can use this, the, the file name or you can use an at syntax uh, to download data remotely. Um, but if you wanna create your own grids or use um, custom data, like if you have a tomographic model, um, the best way to get that into PyGMT is to use an X-Array um, data container, an X-Array data, uh, data array object. And so in this example code here, um, I've imported X-Array and NumPy, and I have a, a, an interesting function of two variables so I can create a gridded data set. And um, all of the code down to here um, is just generating uh, this, this matrix of values, of, of function values, and then um, putting it into a data array format. And then if I want to display that data, I make a call to grid image with the data. And I've specified a color map here. And this is the result. So you see that we had, I specified my X and Y axis ranges in the data. And in this case, this is the case where PyGMT is actually um, deriving the axis limits from the grid. Um, and that's because it can actually get into this data object. Um, and I'll show you what this data object looks like, data. It's an X-Array data array, and it's got these two dimensions in the coordinate section. And that's how PyGMT is able to read, uh, read off uh, the axis limits and plot the data appropriately. So this is what this function looks like. And you, you'll, you'll note here that I've used projection equals x, 3i. And x is just telling GMT that this is a straight up Cartesian coordinate system that's going to be three inches, three inches wide. And so um, like I mentioned in my, in my slides, PyGMT can be used uh, to plot just straight up Cartesian data. And here's a really important um, modification of this code. We have the same data array with values defined from minus 20 to 20, um, but we're gonna use a geographic projection and then we're gonna plot this data. And again, I've just given data to the grid image call. Um, so map, uh, so PyGMT is going to interpret the dimensions as being longitudes and latitudes and plot that grid appropriately. So let's see what this looks like. So you can note here that our grid extent is ranging from minus 20 to 20 degrees latitude and minus 20 uh, to 20 degrees longitude. Um, and so if I actually were to 
uh, specify the central uh, longitude of this map as being zero degrees. You can see this a little bit more clearly that we're centered. Um, so that's how you can use, um, you can plot images and sort of gridded data um, either in Cartesian space or, or in geographic space. Um, now, finally, the, the last major topic I'll bring up here showing a demonstration with PyGMT is how you can access GMT modules uh, from PyGMT. And so, like I mentioned previously, it's really important to understand that uh, PyGMT is just a fancy wrapper um, is just facilitating a fancy, more usable wrapper around GMT modules. And so even if the PyGMT developers have not gotten around uh, to plotting or to wrapping a given command, uh, you can still access it yourself. And so here's an example uh, where we are going to call the GMT module Mecca, which is plotting uh, earthquake focal mechanisms. And so we'll create our PyGMT figure. Um, we're going to create our, our coastlines, our geographic context. Um, and then this is some example code, which uh, allows us to call uh, GMT Mecca and have its output plot onto the existing figure that we're using. Um, and it looks a little complicated and that's because um, Mecca actually requires uh, a text file as input. And so we have to create a temporary file, write some parameters to that file that describe our moment tensor, and then uh, make the call to actually uh, to, to call Mecca with, with that temporary files path. And so um, it looks a little complicated, but it works. And here we're applying the focal mechanism of the um, November 2018 Anchorage. Alaska earthquake. However, um, since I uh, developed these materials initially, uh, this module has actually been wrapped. And so what this looks like now is instead of having to have all these uh, nested context managers, uh, we can just use uh, figure.mecha. And so you can see we have the same start here. Uh, we create our, our, our context and then now it just looks like this. So this is why, um, why it becomes so convenient once a module is wrapped. We have the specify the location of the moment tensor and the depth. And then we just have a dictionary where we actually have meaningful, um, meaningful parameters um, that we can input. And so we have the same result. Um, now we're using the actual official wrapped version of the module. And so, um, you can do this same, you can, same sort of construct um, for any other GMT module um, for which a uh, PyGMT wrapper has not been developed. Um, and the final example I'll show here is another example where we are um, using the module call module functionality of a function that has not been, a module that has not been wrapped yet. Um, so I'll just walk us, walk us through this code here. Um, we're importing UTC date time so we can get the current uh, time using obspy. And then uh, we have this geocoder package and geocoder or geocoding in general allows you to take a string address or city, uh, any sort of location and look up the longitude and latitude. So this uses databases like what Google uses for Google maps essentially that assign a string uh, to a coordinate um, on the earth. And so we're gonna get the current time. And then I have this convenience function called locate, which uh, takes the, um, we geocode the string, uh, the input string, and then we get the latitude and longitude. Um, so the output of locate um, string will be um, a latitude longitude pair. We create our figure. Uh, here we are updating the GMT default. Um, to use a plain uh, map frame instead of a more fancy um, dashed frame. And I am looping over two types of region and uh, projection here. I'm plotting the earth relief 
and I'm plotting some land on top of that. And then this is the uh, key command where I am, I am <clears throat> calling that not yet wrapped uh, pygmt module or gmt module. So I open up a session, which is like opening up a portal um, to the command line uh, interface. And I say, I want to call this module, I want to call solar. Um, and then everything after um, the module name are the uh, arguments that you would give on the command line uh, for that for that module. And so I give it the, um, the color I want uh, to be plotted and then the, the time, because this module is plotting the, uh, the location of dark areas on the earth versus light areas on the earth at a different time, at, at a given time. And so let's go ahead and plot this. And this also might take a while, again, uh, for, for users who have not cached um, or not have not uh, made this call previously because we're going to be downloading um, this gridded data. And this is what the output looks like. So if you, you can remember that I looped over two different regions uh, and also um, two different projections. We have a, a polar stereographic projection here. And on the right, we have a global uh, a projection suitable for global display. Um, the orange star is the location of Fairbanks, which is um, where I'm giving this lecture. And then you can see this shaded area is um, night. So we're, we're up here. You can see that we're actually almost, almost in the area that is fully in the sun um, all day here in the north. And so this is a, another example of calling uh, using PyGMT to access a GMT module. Um, and I said it hadn't been wrapped yet, but um, just as a demonstration of how quickly PyGMT is developing, um, since the beginning of the summer, solar has actually been wrapped um, in the uh, latest release of PyGMT, which is version 0 0.4.0. Um, so, that's just a nice reminder that uh, that these programs are improving all the time. So finally, with PyGMT, I wanted to leave us with some resources. Um, the first place you should stop is uh, the documentation, which lives on pygmt.org. That's just the main page of the project. And there's um, links to a number of useful uh, useful tools for folks getting started. Um, so documentation here, and then for the development version, if you want to get a little bit leading edge. Um, there's a beautiful uh, gallery of examples um, created for GMT, and any of these can be uh, replicated uh, using PyGMT. So just all sorts of, of really, really interesting, really wild um, examples of the capabilities of GMT. And uh, I also want to point out resources. So if you get stuck on something, and uh, if you can't find the answer in the documentation, uh, you can ask on the GMT forum. There's a PyGMT Q&A section on the forum. And usually, folks are, are very responsive uh, in replying to, to questions here. And you can also do a search to see if your particular question has already been asked. So this is the preferred way uh, to, to get your questions answered um, for anything related to PyGMT. And then finally, if you think something isn't working right, if you think there's an actual bug, um, you can file an issue on GitHub. So all of the code development for PyGMT is occurring on GitHub. And so you can uh, file uh, an issue and the developers will respond. So that's PyGMT. And now I want to just go over the very basics of Cartapy. Um, and so I think right before doing that, let's take a um, two minute long break here before I go into Cartapy. So this would be a good time to get some water, use the restroom, et cetera. We'll come back in uh, two minutes here.
All right, so coming back here, let's jump back in and talk a little bit about Cartopi. And we can look at a couple of examples here. So as I mentioned in, in the uh, slides, um, if you've used matplotlib before, um, Cartopi should feel fairly familiar to you because the syntax is somewhat, uh, or, or is, is basically an extension of, um, of matplotlib's syntax. And so let's start with a basic example here. where I have the location of Delhi and I've plotted it. Um, and you might be looking at this and wondering what's going on. Um, you know, Americans in the audience might think that this is a uh, map of Colorado's uh, boundaries. Uh, but in fact, that's actually not what's happening here. Um, what this is a manifestation of is the fact that since Cartopi is built on matplotlib, it inherits uh, matplotlib's um, default behavior of scaling the access limits to fit the data that's being plotted. So um, even though we, we, what we're expecting here uh, is, a, is a global map, what we get is a highly zoomed in view of the area immediately around Delhi, which since we're only plotting coastlines, isn't very interesting. And so in order to uh, get a global view, we need to add, um, this command, which is an extension um, for Cartopi of access.setglobal. And that gives us a global extent. And now we can see the, the full context. And so that's a common um, issue at least I personally run into when I'm, when I'm plotting stuff up and I forget to, to explicitly set um, the limits of my plot. Um, another option you can do besides set global is uh, set extent. Um, so here you can specify a, a minimum and maximum longitude and a minimum and maximum latitude. So I'll say Delhi lawn minus uh, 30 plus 30. And then uh, we'll do minus 15, oops, like that, plus 15. And this gives us a, a smaller plotting box. And so that's how you can um, set the extent of your map. Um, and so set extent, you can actually provide this um, the coordinate reference system that you want to set the extent using, um, kind of like the transform argument for the scatter command. Um, or you can use the, the usual set xlim and set ylim uh, methods for the axis object um, or plt.xlim, plt.ylim. Just note that those are going to use uh, the same coordinate reference system as your projection. Um, so if it's UTM projection, those units are going to be in meters and you have to um, be prepared for, for that. So, the projection and transform arguments here, um, as I pointed out in the slides, um, are really important for allowing you to project your data um, onto the uh, reference system used for the map. Um, and there's a nice example that uh, the Cartopi folks have provided, which illustrates the difference uh, between these two uh, keyword arguments. And so I've adapted that uh, in this example. So here we have uh, created some axes uh, with the projection being a plate Cre, a central longitude of 10. Uh, we add a stock image, which is basically giving uh, like a nice uh, colored image of the natural earth features here. And then we've plotted New York and Delhi, uh, and we've connected them using a line in two different ways. And so the first one, which is this blue uh, curved line on this plot is when we use a geodetic transform. And so in this case, uh, these points are being specified and the line connecting them are being specified um, as two points on the surface of a sphere. And so when we plot them, in a, in a flat 2D uh, sort of page representation, 
this line is the is a great circle arc. It's not a straight line. Um, but when instead we use uh, the transform that's the same as this projected map, um, the line is going to be is straight because it's already in that projected plane specified in that projected plane. So um, this is why it's important to, to understand the transform uh, arguments and use the appropriate one uh, for the data that you're trying to map. Um, and as another example of this sort of the great circle plotting, let's go ahead and plot from New York to Wellington. So the Wellington longitude, Wellington latitude, and let's make this red. And this is another really nice example where uh, the straight line path on the projected surface would be going directly directly across. But when you consider, imagine that this, this image has been wrapped around a sphere, uh, the shortest um, path along the sphere is actually following this, this great circle. This great circle arc it sort of looks like if you've ever seen a, a flight plan map, um, looks a little similar to that. Now, um, just as a final wrap up for, for Cardify, um, the Cardify webpage has some great sections for getting started and getting involved. And these, that's these two sections here. Um, they've got a nice installation guide. They've got these great uh, sort of small tutorials for understanding the various, the, the transform and the projection. That's sort of what I went over just now. Um, they talk about um, information for developers and uh, you know, what's new, so the change log. And then um, they also have um, some good information here about how to cite the project, um, how to report bugs. And you'll note that's a very similar system to um, what PyGMT has implemented. So it's again, it's on GitHub using issues. Um, and then you can use Stack Overflow uh, to ask your questions. Um, so those are some resources for uh, Cardify specifically. So that's the end of the uh, sort of tutorial notebook here. Um, everyone should have that uh, available to them. Um, and before we head out here uh, into the lab, um, I'll just, before I get off of Zoom here, I will briefly discuss the lab notebook. Um, the lab notebook has uh, two PyGMT based activities that are meant to um, get you thinking about real world sort of applications of PyGMT that you might encounter in your uh, seismological research. And the first one is making a station map um, using an input obspy stream. And so I provided a function that will attach uh, the coordinates to the, the stream object. And then uh, you'll work on modifying a function that plots stations on a map, um, and you'll modify it to label those stations. And so this will involve looking at the PyGMT uh, text method uh, documentation. So that's the to-do right here. And then the other activity we have is um, another real-world application, which is plotting uh, tomographic models. And so um, I've created a fake uh, velocity model, um, volcanic uh, velocity structure, um, uh, emphasis on fake. And uh, I've provided that to you all and um, some code um, which plots up a nice shaded relief map of uh, this uh, volcano, the Arica, um, but does not actually display the tomographic slice. And so you will um, help finish this code so that we can um, plot any of the depth slices to this tomographic model. And so that's the Roses Mapping Lab file. Um, I will be on Slack to answer any questions related to lab uh, as you work through it. Um, and uh, I'll also be available to answer any, any questions that might arise uh, for those um, both following live and also watching the recording. So that is it for my lecture 
portion here and for the Zoom portion. Um, and I'll open it up if there are any uh, questions folks want to ask while we're live. All right. Well, it doesn't seem like we have any uh, any questions here, so just feel free to um, enter those in in Slack in the uh, Unit Five channel, and I'll make sure to to um, to answer you there. And good luck working through the lab activity. Thanks so much, Liam. I'm gonna end our recording, and we will reconvene on Slack.